All right, guys, Dan back again. Uh, today, I'm actually filming this on a nice sunny afternoon. Um, I thought I'd film myself on the waist down somewhere in shorts today. It's actually really nice outside. Uh, but we're actually going to continue a little mini series that I've been doing on my channel over the last 12 months or so, which has been all about connecting my retro systems up to the internet and getting kind of old machines onto the net and, you know, what can we do with them online, basically. Now, about a month ago, I did a video on hooking up my Amiga and my Commodore CDTV to bulletin board systems via a uh, serial share through a Windows PC. So if you're interested in that, have a look back about a month ago in my YouTube channel. I haven't done many videos since, to be fair. Should be quite easy to find. Uh, about a year ago, we did one on connecting up the uh, Amiga 1200 to the World Wide Web IRC uh, via Ethernet and TCP IP. By far, though, since doing those videos, the most requested vid that I've had since then is connecting up the Commodore 64 to the net. Lots of people saying there must be a way to do the uh, the 8-bit legend. How do we get this online? And uh, there are actually a couple of ways of doing it. Now, I do know there is a, a way of connecting this to a PC and uh, sharing it via serial like we did with the uh, Amiga in my last video. However, on today's video, we're going to be concentrating on a dedicated solution. That means you can actually hook up your uh, Commodore 64 to the net via Ethernet. I've actually got mine connected via Wi-Fi, so I'll get a bit more into that recently. Now, I did want to get this video made a couple of weeks ago, but I actually ran into a few problems. So I'll talk you through those a bit later on as well, and hopefully you won't come into the uh, same issues, or if you do, you'll be able to overcome them a little bit quicker than I did. And you might be looking actually out the corner of your eye thinking, hang on, isn't there a Commodore 64 there, just in frame, and what in here? Yeah, I've actually got two Commodore 64s. Doesn't everybody? Right, so uh, the way we're going to be connecting this to the internet is by using this little cartridge. Now this is called a 64NIC or 64NIC plus if you like uh, network interface card. What it basically does is it connects to the um, back of the Commodore 64 into the cartridge port on the back and then if you see on the side of it there there is an Ethernet port and uh, from using there are several different software solutions you can then get your Commodore 64 connected up directly to the internet using this cartridge. So we'll uh, have a little close-up of it, I'll give you a little tour of the cartridge and then we'll look at installing the software and uh, we'll have a little bit of fun on the internet with the Commodore 64. Now this board was originally conceived back in the late noughties. Um, it was actually a crowd fundraiser from the Commodore 64 community who decided that it really was about time that the Commodore 64 and the 128, which um, this also works with, had an affordable Ethernet solution to get it online, as uh, before that you had, um, for example, RRNet, which was a more advanced but also a lot more expensive um, cart than this. Now, uh, this basically is compatible with RRNet, and it gives you 10 megabit Ethernet connectivity, but that is literally pretty much all it does. So if all you want to do is get your Commodore 64 um, hooked up to Ethernet and get it online, really simple way of doing it. Now I picked my card up for £50 and the website I bought it from actually charged an extra £5 to uh, supply this little plastic case here as well for the cartridge, some housing for it. The only problem is if you look we've got these switches and obviously the Ethernet port is at the side and we've got this button at the top here, there isn't actually any cutouts for the various ports and connectors on here so uh, it won't actually close up and I haven't got the correct tools to cut them out just yet so at the moment I'm uh, using my 64NIC bare board hooked into the back of my Commodore 64 which you know is not the tidiest way of doing it but I've had no problems doing it that way so far. Now I'll give you a quick tour of the board I mean it's actually pretty simple this cartridge you've got the uh, cartridge connector at the bottom there here we have an EEPROM port here so uh, in this socket you can connect up custom ROMs and you can uh, also install software on there that you use regularly on your Commodore 64. For example, you may have you know, your Telnet client and your uh, IRC software, maybe some games that you play online regularly. Rather than loading them from disk every time, you can just um, burn your own ROM up to 256K, pop it into this socket and then you can have access to them all the time. It can even boot directly from it as well, so that's kind of cool. And then if we look on the side of it there, we've got the Ethernet connector. Um, with an activity light and a connection light there as well. Something on the back that Commodore 64 users have been crying out for for decades is a reset switch. So uh, rather than turning your 64 off and on, when you want to reset it, you can tap that and it will reboot the machine. Um, we have a few selectors here as well. If I give you a close-up, you can see what they are on the board here. Now, basically, it's for different modes of compatibility and uh, different options with the uh, EEPROM. The only thing is, 
I haven't got a ROM installed in this, so if you want to use it default, as I am, leave all the switches up in their default position. We've got a little rotary switch here as well that, that basically is there to select the different software you may have installed on the ROM. And uh, that is pretty much an overview of the board itself, really. There's not a lot more to it. It doesn't need power or anything like that supplying separately. Um, it doesn't need to be connected to anything apart from the Commodore itself, so it is really, you know self-contained solution. So we'll get this hooked up to the Commodore 64 and uh, I'll give you a little demo of how it works. Right now, just quickly, I thought I'd go handheld for a moment to give you a quick overview of my Commodore 64 setup, which has changed a little bit recently. I've simplified it a bit and uh, introduced a few new things. One of them is actually this um, uh, 64 NIC card that we're talking about in this video. So we've got my uh, bread bin C64 there with the uh, the early orange function keys on there. Uh, plugged into the user port at the back, which you probably can't see because of the monitor now. Um, I've got the 64 NIC Plus plugged into there. The Philips CRT 14 inch monitor um, hooked up via uh, composite into there. The uh, SD card reader that I've done a video on before, the SD2 IEC there, a 1541 floppy disk drive. And this thing on top of it here, which is a Netgear wireless bridge. Now, I did mention before that I've got my Commodore 64 hooked up to the internet wirelessly. Now, what I've actually got is the, um, the 64 NIC is plugged into the user port. There is an ethernet cable that goes from there and then goes into the back of this little Netgear bridge I've got here. And then I've um, put a bit of Velcro on the bottom of it and it just kind of sits on top of my 1541. Now, what you do with this little Netgear bridge is you initially connect it up to um, a modern machine you know with a web browser and then you configure it through a web interface and put in your wireless settings and that means that after that every time you turn it on it stores it in its memory you can then basically put your wireless connection share it through the ethernet port on this bridge so even machines that haven't got you know wireless drivers and that kind of thing it's completely irrelevant really all the uh, commodore 64 c's is an ethernet connection and then this uh, little netgear bridge basically bridges that to my uh, router in my next room so if you want to get wi-fi on your uh, classic machines really good way of doing it i think that was about 50 pounds off amazon so um in all this solution was about 100 quid Cost a fair bit, however, it's pretty cool. So we'll go back on the tripod now and explore a little bit of the software on the Commodore 64. Okay, now quickly before we get started on the Commodore 64, um, I thought I'd just quickly show you the um, 64 NIC Plus website here, which you'll need to go on if you bought a cartridge that didn't actually come with any software supplied. You'll need to download the um, D64 images, obviously, to uh, use your cart and get some of the uh, software to connect it online. Now. I am being a little bit lazy today. I've kind of just focused the camera on my Morpho S machine screen here as I wasn't really in the mood to capture video and do much editing today. I am sorry. It's sunny outside, you know. I want to go and find a beer garden in a bit. So uh, I'll put all the links and everything in the video description. Don't worry. So we're on this website here, the um, Go For Retro website. Now, if you scroll down, when you get past all the information on the uh, the cartridge itself. There's a little link here to the uh, software disk image. If you click that, it will give you a uh, download for a D64 file. Um, now I've concentrated on writing software from a, uh, a PC, or in this case a Morpho S machine, to uh, Commodore 64s in the past using flashcards or uh, XM1541 cables, that kind of thing. So check my uh, video history and check out the um, the Commodore 64 flashcard solution if you've got no way of actually getting these onto a floppy disk. If you're really stuck, drop me a PM, I can give you a bit of help with that. So uh, definitely grab the uh, utilities disk off the Go for Retro website. And also, another site worth having a quick look at is the Contiki download site, contiki.cbm8bit.com. Now here, you select the machine that you've got, you select the um, cartridge you've got as well. As I mentioned, the 64NIC is RRNet compatible, so we select that one. You put your IP address in, um, that your 64, that you'd like to you know, use for your Commodore 64, and, and then you can select whether you want all of the disks or just the first one. You don't need all the utilities if you don't want. And then you can click download, and then it will give you a D64 image. It's already configured, which is very cool. So you're going to need to grab a few utilities. I've already got those and I put them on a floppy disk. So we'll hop back over to the Commodore 64 now. Right now, just quickly, I've actually had a little uh, rearrange of my Commodore 64 setup. Um, I've swapped that CRT monitor I normally use for this modern HDTV, which uh, <laughs> does look a little bit ridiculous, you know, perched on top of the Commodore 64. However, 
Um, it does mean that for the purposes of filming, it's going to be a lot clearer because on CRT we get those black bands going up and down the screen. And you can kind of see what's going on a lot better where, when filming an LCD screen. So uh, I thought I'd swap it over quickly. Now, the Utilities Disc and the um, Contiki program, I have actually downloaded those disc images and written them to a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. I could have put it on my SD card, but you know, I thought if we're going to go old school, let's go all the way. And I'm going to run a terminal program here, which is called Kipperterm. Now I've loaded that into memory. I was going to quickly run that off the disk. There we are. Now the good thing about Kipperterm is that it uses DHCP, which means it basically gets all of the network configuration um, settings automatically. So you can configure it manually with F7 if you want, but um, if it does it all for you, then uh, it's even easier. So we'll press F1 for Telnet. And I've got to say a quick shout here to Back to School Days, Andy from YouTube, who's actually sent me a list of um, some popular Commodore 64 Telnet boards. So uh, thanks, Andy. I'm going to try a few of those. A couple of them I've already been on today, actually. Um, so we'll try the first one on his list, which is called the Cottonwood BBS. Um, thanks, spell it right. Cottonwood BBS. Dot dn dot dns dot org um, port 23 now you can pick your graphics mode here either vt100 which is a bit more industry standard or petski which is the uh, it's kind of a bit bit like ansi it's a graphics mode for commodore 8-bit computers so we'll go with that and we are connecting to that board now connected hit return enter messages in 40 or 80 we'll go with 40 uh, are you using a Commodore graphic terminal program? Yes, we are. And there we go. Enter your membership number. Now, uh, <laughs> got to kind of remember what my membership number is off the top of my head. I think I'm number 150 on this board. Uh, let's try that. And my password. Invalid password. Let's try that one more time. Might be 160. Well remembered, there we are. Um, now it gives you a little bit of information on the, your uh, previous time on this board. I've dialed up three times before. And there we are, the uh, Cottonwood BBS logo in glorious ANSI graphics. Now this board's been around for years. I think it opened in 1988. Uh, it tells you it's running at 2400 board. I believe this is actually running on a uh, Commodore 64 as well. So we'll press the key to continue. And then it gives you uh, your mailbox. We've got an email there by the looks of it. Let's have a look. Hello and welcome. I've added your name to the membership list area. Uh, there we go. That's from uh, Balzabar. I believe he's either the uh, the sysop or the uh, one of the moderators on the board. So, uh, okay. I guess we'll just kind of hold that. And we press the question mark for the menu. That should take us to the BBS's main menu. And then you can... Um, basically select an option off here. So we'll have a look what's going on here. Um, what options can we do? Now there's a downloads area, uh, membership list. We can read messages that are on the board. Let's have a quick look then, read. So these are messages that other board users have left, kind of a public wall that we can look at here. Um, yeah, general forum there. Classified ads. I remember this board is running at 2400 board, it said, so uh, you do have to wait around for a few things. So basically, this is a discussion forum, so we won't spend ages looking at all of this on here. Um, so I think if I press question mark, it should take me back to the main menu. Or maybe not. <laughs> Starting with message 1031. Uh, how do we just get back to the menu then? There we go. Back to the menu. Uh, so we'll have a look at something else on here. I did say there's a few games, I think, as well. So we'll try those, see what they're like. Um, what was the games area? Games and other games menu G. So basically what you're looking at here is, you know, before the days of the World Wide Web and uh, the days when uh, everyone had internet access, this is the way people shared information online um, and the way that you did online gaming. You know, back 30 years ago, if you had to go online back in, say, you know, 1984, this would be how your uh, online interface looked, really. So we'll try this game here. Not sure what this one is. 
Master's Empire. Some very nice Petsky graphics there as well. I'm not sure if this is a uh, multi-user dungeon game or what. It looks like there's some uh, guys in suits of armor there. Have a requirement take. Like, uh, it looks more like a stocks trading game actually, doesn't it? There we go, we'll come out of that because I've got no idea what I'm doing. Quick game. Let's try another one from the list. We've got Hangman, everyone can play Hangman. So we pick a letter, A. S. Uh, we'll come up T. Now it doesn't give you any information on what it is though. You know, normally you get a clue like you know it's a sportsman or something like that. So uh, <laughs> really just guessing a random word here. Uh, what else can we have? E. There is an E. S something T S T E something. Oh, I think we've already used that. Let's have a look. Uh, <laughs> Very bad memory. So what else can we have? O. Uh, L. What could that word be? I think we're going to die. I'm curious as to what the word is now. I won't spend ages. Ah, <laughs> oh, have we used that one yet? There is an R. Oh my word, come on. What we're going to... Ah, sister. There we go. Brilliant. So uh, yeah, it's a quick look at a uh, Commodore 64 bulletin board. We can come out of that and uh, try another one really quickly. We'll try uh, UDI dot DYNDNS dot TV. And this one is on port 6400. And Petsky, of course. And then we're connected to this, running on the Centipede BBS system, which, if uh, memory serves, is actually a, uh, a hosting service for bulletin boards, kind of software that you run a BBS on. I've got 40. There we go, look at that. Uh, it gives you a few stats about it. The SysOps name, Alwiz. Um, UDI, is that's probably the name of his crew. Uh, online games, running on Centipede, 38K board. This one's a bit quicker. 120 gigs. So my membership number, I think I was number... 11 on this one. It's worth keeping a note of your um, BBS membership numbers, as most of them ask you for your number rather than your handle. Apparently I'm knowledgeable, even though I've only called three times. I can leave a message on the boards. Check out the wall. Yeah, why not? Oh, it's a graffiti wall. These are uh, messages that other users have uh, left recently. So you can type a quick message and uh, the next time someone else logs on, they'll see it. We won't do a message for now. And then we should get the, yeah, it's checking for new news. Any uh, bulletin-wide messages, none of those. My mailbox, none of those. Uh, back in the day, you could often go on what was called FidoNet. So that meant the bulletin boards actually linked up to each other. So you could share um, emails between the boards. Um, before that, though, you could only email other people on your uh, same bulletin board. So we've got the main uh, BBS menu there. The underground domain. Now, by the looks of this, it's a bit more of a pirate board. There's a lot of wares and stuff on it. Um, we'll have a look at the art section though, Jay. And there we get a list of all of the uh, the pictures that people have left on the board. I think you probably go got to go right to the end of the list before you get an option of uh, actually choosing one of them. So uh, we'll quickly go through this. And I'll type in a number at random. I hope there's not too many. Ghostbusters 2, 180. That might be interesting. Okay, let's pick one. What, what did I say? 180. Let's try that one. There we go. The Ghostbusters 2 logo in uh, Petsky text. Probably made back in like 1989 when uh, the movie came out. So there we go, it's a quick look at um, dialing up bulletin boards on the Commodore 64. Now, uh, we'll just quickly reset the machine. And I'm going to show you something else. We'll try going on to uh, chat, onto IRC. 
Right, now I've swapped over to the Contiki utility disc. Now, um, I've just spared you about 90 seconds to two minutes worth of disc loading for uh, the configuration and the IRC client. As I mentioned before, you've got to be patient using this classic hardware. Now, I thought we'd have a quick look at a few of the bundled utilities with the Contiki suite. The first one is an IRC uh, client, allowing you to go on internet relay chat. So, um, you know, it's kind of cool to be chatting away on a Commodore 64. So. We'll connect to a server quickly. Um, I'll show you the same one that I connected to on my uh, Amiga BBS video. So irc.twit.tv, uh, um, irc nickname, anything will do, Dan C64, and uh, then we'll connect to that. And now we're logging onto the server. And uh, IRC servers normally give you their kind of server rules and everything and some information when you log in. Obviously, it was designed for uh, modern machines, so it doesn't really display all that well on a 40-column, 30-year-old Commodore 64 display. So uh, there's quite a lot of word wrap going on there. Now, we'll join a channel, so we'll go on Twit Live. And I do normally demo with uh, this IRC server because it is one of the most active ones that I know. Uh, Leo Laporte's Twit Network. Uh, the downside of that is I'm looking on my uh, MorphOS machine here. There's 835 users in this channel right now. And the uh, IRC client here will list all of the users in the channel before it allows you to see the conversation. So we may have to bear with it a few seconds while it actually pulls up all the channel list on the Commodore 64. As you can see over here, I've got the same channel connected. And it mentions there that I've just joined Dan C64. And that is literally a list of all of the people that are currently active in this uh, IRC channel. And uh, when it's finished loading that, it should catch up with the conversation that I'm seeing on my other screen right now. I think the Commodore 64 generally works better for uh, less active IRC channels. There we are, people are chatting away now. Quite a lot of conversation going on here. Uh, Pizza Box says, could be a big hit in emerging markets. So uh, yeah, I mean, we're in the middle of a live conversation. We could chat back and... Uh, that's how you do IRC on the Commodore 64, really straightforward actually. I'll show you another um, interesting utility on the Contiki disk, uh, which is a web browser, a text-based one obviously, uh, a version of Lynx actually for, for the Commodore 64, so we'll quickly load that up and I'll give you a quick demo. Right, now we're inside the uh, web browser software from the Contiki Utilities disk. You'll probably notice actually there is what appears to be a mouse pointer in the middle of the screen. And uh, that's exactly what it is actually. If you've got access to a 1351 Commodore mouse, you can use this inside the web browser software to click on the uh, various options at the top and around the page as well, um, as a driver actually comes bundled with it. Unfortunately, I haven't got one, so uh, we're limited to using the keyboard. Um, now, as I mentioned before, there's going to be no graphics, no videos, anything like that. This is literally a straightforward text-based browser, but if I type in a web address, we should get the... Uh, the text of the website downloaded. It says receiving web page at the bottom there, which is a good sign. <laughs> it works better with quite simple websites that you're not, you know, haven't got loads of frames or anything like that, which Amiga.org is actually quite a basic page. And uh, yeah, I mean, it shows us all the separate sections that we've got there, you know, the, the password login and everything. We can go uh, up and down. So we'll click down, that'll take us to the next bit, which should be the forums, I think. And there will be people who will probably comment on this video going, what on earth is the point in that? You could do it on your wristwatch quicker than this. Um, which is true, however, the you know the kind of joy of doing this is just to see the World Wide Web on a Commodore 64. So we won't go too in depth because it's a little bit painful, but you know, it's kind of cool to know that it can do it. And I'll quickly give you a uh, directory listing of the other software that features on the, um, the first Contiki disk, because there is actually four of them you can download. One of the cool things that actually comes with it and there are people making use of this, is a web server, believe it or not. If I do a uh, directory listing quickly for you, you can see there we've got um, a program called Web Server. And there are people, believe it or not, that are actually hosting websites on a Commodore 64. 
Uh, yeah, we'll include the most famous one in the video description if you want to see it, but that in itself is extremely cool. And there are four separate discs to um, Contiki, so if you want to have a look, obviously I'll leave the link to uh, the Contiki software in the video description. Now, I thought I'd save the coolest bit of this demonstration until the end of the video, so right now I'm going to show you something that absolutely blew my mind the first time I tried it. All right, now for the final demo of this video, I've had to go handheld again because I'm going to need to show you my Commodore 64 screen and the screen on my Windows PC for the uh, final demonstration, which will be how to copy files over the network from a connected machine to the Commodore 64. Now you may remember last year I showed you how to hook up a Commodore 64 1541 floppy disk drive to a PC to copy files and do disk images. I used to actually have two of these drives permanently set up, one on the Commodore 64 and one on a Windows PC. Now I've only got one of them because of this piece of software here which is called Warp Copy 64. Now, I've currently got the server running on my Commodore 64. We can see it's got an IP address allocated, 192.168.0.64. And then, if I take you over to my Windows PC, we've got these, the client software running here with the same IP address in the bottom. And watch what happens if I click on Directory here. It will then give me a listing of the files that are on the floppy disk in the 1541 that's connected to my Commodore 64, which is very cool in itself. And it's also really, really quick uh, because you can see we've got this option here, fast IEC. So basically um, it means, for example, if I've got this file here, setmac.prg, I can drag and drop that from my Windows desktop into here. My 1541 activity light will come on. In a couple of seconds, it will copy the file over. That is now done. This is directory and there it is again at the top. Which is amazing, you know, you can download files straight off the internet and copy them straight onto your Commodore 64 1541. It's not the coolest thing, however, if I was to remove that disk and pop in a blank floppy disk, and then we'll find, if I click on right image here, and we'll find a D64 file. We've got Arkanoid 64 there, so that's the game Arkanoid. Double click on that. And now the Commodore 64 screen will blank, the disk drive will come on, and it's now copying that disk image to the floppy disk at a very high speed. The 64 actually blanks its screen to be able to cope with this. And uh, you know, normally if you were to do this without the fast IEC mode on, this would take about 20 minutes. You can do this in around 30, 40 seconds using warp copy with the fast IEC mode activated. And what we're seeing there is actually the sectors of the disk all filling up. If they all go green, everything's fine. If you get a red one, something's gone wrong. Generally, though, it works really well. If we go back to the 64 now, the screen should come back on in a moment. And that's now finished writing. So if I reboot the 64 and we type in the load command here, comma nine, and we should be able to play Arkanoid directly from this disc, the uh, D64 image of which I literally downloaded from the internet in about two seconds, and then wrote it in, what was that, about 45 seconds? It copied over warp copy 64 to this uh, 1541 drive, and now we can play it directly from floppy disk. So, um, you know, if you haven't got a uh, an SD2 IEC or any other flashcard solution on your Commodore 64, you can't be bothered to wait for cassette tapes, and you know, it is a real headache writing those. This is a great way of doing it. You know, the software's all free if you've got the um, the 64 NIC cartridge. And then you can literally write anything you want to your uh, 1541 floppy drive over the network from a connected PC. I'll spare you the really long disk loading time again. So uh, we're straight into the game now. Took about a minute to load a floppy disk as it normally would. We've got the uh, cracked row as it's not a legal version. <laughs> uh, skip past the documentation. And when we get into the game, it should play like, uh, you know, any other download a Commodore 64 game. There we go, Arkanoid Menu. Now, I must admit I was never the greatest at this game back in the day. And I'm probably even worse now. So 
So there you go. That was a, uh, I was going to say, quick overview of the uh, Commodore 64, uh, 64 NIC. However, I started that video at, what, 3 o'clock this afternoon. It's now 8 p.m. Um, so I think I've missed the beer garden this afternoon. Uh, however, I really enjoyed showing it off. I mean, there was quite a lot in that video, uh, probably a lot of editing for me to do now as well. Hopefully you weren't too bored, but it is quite an in-depth subject. You know, there's quite a lot that you can do with the Commodore 64 being hooked up online, particularly warp copy. I think, you know, it's worth the, the 50 quid for the hardware just to be able to do that personally. So uh, if you've got any questions, please leave them in the video below or a comment on the blog. Make sure you join us on Facebook if you get a minute as well. Um, our community's kind of grown on there quite slowly, but I would like more more fans and their friends on Facebook. You know, we've got a lot going on there. Uh, Facebook.com slash KookieTech. My blog is at KookieTech.net. Follow me on Twitter, Google Plus, all the usual places. And uh, everything you need to know will be in the video description. And I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you for watching.